let me invite your attention to 1 Thessalonians again tonight. And tonight, we're going to have a bit of a, a review. I know last week, we, we spent some time uh, naturally in, 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 in good use of time in praying for um, our church and, and praying for the mission of the church after our business meeting. But tonight, I want to kind of come back and review with you where we've been over the last few weeks in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So tonight we're going to conclude 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 with some additional verses, but I also wanted to go back and review a little bit on, on where we've been. There's only 10 verses in 1, chapter, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, so let me come back and read all 10 of them together, and then we'll kind of review what we've already talked about a little bit, and then also hit a few of these newer passage verses that we hadn't worked in. Paul and Sylvanius and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grace and to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. We hit that pretty hard one time. And our Lord Jesus and the Christ in the presence of God and our Father, knowing Brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. Now, these are the verses I kind of wanted to work in tonight. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us in the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God, whom has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turn to God from idols, to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he has raised from the dead, and that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So tonight I wanted to say, as I said, in some ways come back and pick up a little bit of a rebuke. You know, Mark Howell talked about these, uh, this church, and he, he gave a description that I really like. He said that this church of Thessalonica was a genuine church, this church was a dynamic church, and this church was a contagious church. And I think that, man, to think about those descriptors, uh, if that could be all churches, but man, that would be a, that would be a testimony. It was a, a church that was genuine, genuine in their faith and in their love for Jesus. A church that was dynamic in their relationship with the Lord and, and serving the Lord in their community and contagious uh, that people wanted to be a part of what was happening in and of that church. So after his customary greeting in verse 1, Paul began to turn his attention and he talked about how their faith was working, their love was laboring, and their hope was enduring. And that they had experienced a genuine conversion that changed the whole direction of their lives. You know, when we started this, we looked for the first week in Acts chapter 17, where we see where Paul and Silas and, and, and Timothy were there for about three weeks. And it tells us in that passage in Acts 17 that they went for three Sabbaths to the synagogue. And he tells us there in Acts 17, 2 and 3, this is what the scripture reads. Paul reasoned with them from scriptures, explaining and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead, and that this Jesus that was proclaimed is indeed the Messiah. John MacArthur says this, Faith does not come merely by hearing the words of truth. For truth spoken is not accompanied by the power. If it is not is accompanied by the power of God, it is nothing. And that's the truth. People hear the gospel all the time. They may hear the gospel, but without the work of the Holy Spirit, it's just words. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that falls in with the word of the gospel that draws people. 
Jesus told us in John chapter 6, 44, unless the Father draws him, no one can come to me. It's the work of the Father through the Holy Spirit working that draws people to the gospel. So a gospel illuminating the work of the Holy Spirit, yeah, that is where we are. You know, I think about all the times we share the message of Jesus in the church. We share it on in, in, in Sunday mornings. We share it on Sunday nights. We share it on Wednesday nights. We share it in vacation Bible school. We do the ABCs of, of believing in vacation Bible school. Many of you work or have worked or continue to work in vacation Bible school. And so when we're doing that, we may have, let's just say, I don't know, 100 people. Let's just say 100 people hear the same gospel message, but it's only those that the Holy Spirit is drawing and working in in that moment that it really resonates within them. We've got to have the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's where the church of Thessalonica was experienced. And they were experiencing God working through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit opening the eyes of people and opening the ears of people. That they would see their lost condition. That they would hear the gospel is what they need. To unveil the hardness of their heart. That their heart would be open to the gospel message. And that God would begin to work in that way. And they were, had not only the conversion that changed their direction, but a conversion that changed their affection. In verse 9, we find that they had turned away from idols and they had become to a living God and had a living faith. You know, turning from idols is, is, is not that easy. Uh, if you've been anywhere where you've seen idol, or idols, maybe it's a... A Buddha, maybe it's any type of uh, type of other description. I was talking last Sunday night when we were talking about the house we looked at in Vicksburg, and not only did it have an unusual scent or spices that we had, but we went into the shrine room in this house. And so I went in this house, and it was a practicing Hindu, and so we went to look at this house, and not only were there different smells in the house, but there was a room that was a shrine to a Hindu goddess. And, I, and uh, so we were looking at a potential house on the market. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm not, mm -mm, we're going to have to, we would have to, like, I don't know, have an exorcist. I don't know what we have to do. I don't know. It's kind of crazy up in here. But, but, but you know, but I, you know, that's easy for me to see. I don't like, I don't wood, stick, stone, and metal the idols. You know, I, I don't want that. But at the same time, we idolatrize so many different things. We, we can make an idol out of a relationship. We can make an idol out of a, 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 a hobby, anything. Timothy Keller says this, an idol set as a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your passion and energy on, your emotional and your financial resources on, without second thought. That becomes an idol. Anything that controls your thought, your thinking, your spending, anything that you elevate to that place, then we've become and placed it in a place as an idol in our lives. And so here in verse chapter 1, verse 9, Paul is commending them, saying, hey, you left, you've left idolatry. You, have, you are pursuing the one true living God. God has first place in your life. We're going to see this taught by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount this week when we're getting into Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 and 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the things that you worry about, will be, they're going to be taken care of. And so we're going to talk about, you know, worry this weekend. We're going to talk about the things that we worry about, the things that we stress over. And so that transformation is due to the reality of coming to faith in God. And so they had not only a conversion that changed their direction in life, being saved, a conversion that changed their affection from the idols to the one and true living God, but a conversion that also changed their reflection about what they were going to do in life, that a Christian should view their present circumstances in light 
of eternal promises. And that's really where we found in verse 10. In verse 10, as Paul was ending that, he says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised us from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. I think it's noteworthy to realize that oh, Paul wasn't giving a, 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 a tremendous treatise on everything there is to know about the second coming of Jesus. Jesus doesn't even talk about it that much. He says, hey, you know, there's many things I would love to tell you, but you can't bear them right now. But know this, Dad's going to let me come back. And suffice to you say, what are the signs and the seasons? And Jesus says, I'm coming back. So he's, Paul here is writing, and he's talking more, more than theological terms about it. He's talking about it from a pastoral realm. He's saying the purpose was to build within the readers then and we today an expectation of a hope for the future. He wanted to reassure us that despite present persecution, despite hard times, despite difficult days, we can be confident and we can be hopeful in our future. Even when our loved ones who are in Christ pass and it hurts and it's painful and we don't know how we're going to work through this void in our lives when we know she or he is in Jesus, we know they're okay. We, because we have a hope, a living hope. And so Paul was writing from a pastoral standpoint more than a theological standpoint of this is going to happen, that's going to happen, this is going to happen, the end times are going to come, all the things that are going to happen, all these things. He's like, listen, don't put your hope in today. Put your hope into tomorrow. Live with an expectancy of what God is going to do. Be hopeful about the future so today you can pursue your walk with Christ with an expectant anticipation of his return. And so while everybody else in the world is looking around in confusion, you're living with anticipation, anticipation of when that day comes. You don't have to be confused about what in the world's going on. It's coming to an end. It's going to be, it's going to come to an end. You know, before long, this world's going to come to an end like, it, like we didn't know that was going to happen. It's going to happen. So we're already anticipating what's going to come with the end of the world as we know it. But this church was very genuine in their approach. This church was dynamic. There was two great things happening in the lives of people. Number one, there was their experience of salvation. And number two, their experience of surrender. Those two things are coupled together in your walk with Christ. When you come to Christ in salvation and when you surrender your will to Christ. Some people don't get to point two. You with me? They're still fighting that. They're still fighting that your thy will be done thing. They can't and won't get there to surrender their lives to Jesus. We sing it, I surrender all, and we, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. Salvation is the first step to Jesus. Surrender is when you're completely given over to him. And that's what it's going to take for a dynamic church. Right. It's for a church to be surrendered to the will of the Lord, not to the will of my whims. And so when we grasp his will, we understand his purpose individually better. And we'll never understand his purpose for our lives until we've surrendered our will to him. Now, chapter 1, verse 3, we've already talked about, but I'm going to mention it. He talked about we, they had a working faith. They had a faith that showed. Not only did they have a working faith, but they had a laboring love in verse 3. A laboring love that they were willing to do what God wanted them to do out of love for the Lord and to serve the Lord. And then 3, they had an enduring hope. All three of those are found in chapter 1, verse 3. He commends them in this letter and say, look, when I look at you, I see that your faith is is working. You have put your faith to work. You didn't just sit back and say, I have faith, but I'm not going to do anything. You put your faith to work. And, not, and the reason why you did that was because you're serving 
out of love for the Lord and love for one another. And then third, you're having an enduring hope. As Barclay likes to put it or aptly put it in his book, a man can endure anything as long as he has hope. For when he is walking into the night, he is not walking into the night, but he knows he is walking into the dawn. Hope lets you know the sun is still going to come up. Even in the darkest of night, it's still going to come. Hope tells us that there's going to be something that's going to come. We talked geographically in the first night a long time ago when we started this series earlier in the month on Thessalonica. And I was sharing with you geographically it's a port city. Geographically it's also at the crossroads where many roads go through. And so Satan was very resistant to have a church there because of where it's located strategically on the highways and the waterways and the byways. So if this church ever took root and people could share the gospel, the gospel would go out. And so Satan would do everything possible to hinder the success of that church. But let's be reminded, and we're going to talk about this later in the spring. The Lord's leading me to a series of messages on spiritual warfare. But let's be sure Satan wants to do everything he can do to hinder the mission and the work of First Baptist Church, Bingham and Dove. Not because we're, bit, we're all that. Because if he can trip us up, get us sideways, and make us fail, we will not carry the message of Jesus the way he intends us to carry the message of Jesus. We won't fail it. We'll get sidetracked. We'll get, it, we'll get eaten alive. We'll do all these other things. And when, our, when we declare our allegiance to Jesus, we are declaring war on hell. And when we declare war on hell, Satan comes after us. Leon Morris said this, It is not a quiet, passive resignation, but an active constancy in the face of difficulty. That's what he said hope is. Hope is not quiet. Hope is not a passive resignation to go sit over in the corner and say, I hope it all works out. But you press on with confidence in the living God. You press on because you know God's still got this. Hope gives you the strength to keep on going. I came across this verse last week. I, I, should, I should have put it on the deal. I didn't send it to Ben so he doesn't know. But let's just take the word hope. Just think of it like this. H-O-P-E. Hold on to the promises God's given you eternally. Hold on to the promises God's given you for eternity. That's hope. Hope's holding on. Holding on to the promises that God's given you that is going to last through all eternity. Man, just hang on. Hope is just staying in it and continuing to hold on to the promises that God has given you for all eternity. It's tough here. It's hard here. When Paul was worried about this church, as I can only imagine that he was, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said this. He said, you know, all the things, you know, I've been shipwrecked, I've been beaten, all these other things. But he ends it by saying this. But the thing that is my greatest concern is my concern over the church. It's like, you know what? The bruises heal. The lashes will be mended. But the thing that internally gets me is being my concern over the church. That never stops that never ceases that never goes away because i'm praying and longing for the church to do well howell wrote about a church being contagious here you know we wonder sometimes we we're of course here tonight we're in the room and some of you will be watching this later but you know your members are affiliated somehow with first baptist bay Manette, and i'm thankful that you are i'm glad you're here Glad you're not elsewhere. Glad you're not, you know, at home going, wonder what's going on at church tonight, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. 
but when we ride by churches, do you ever go, wonder what's going on in there? Wonder what that church is about. I do. I do. If things go well, as planned, I'm probably going to sneak out of here and go to Brandon. There's two little kids that, you know, need, need their papa this weekend. They need, you know, it's just got to happen. But I'll pass a lot of churches on my route. And I'll pass them and I'll say, wonder what's going on over there. wonder what they're about. wonder what they're doing. I wonder what's happening over there. And I always read their signs. I always read the church signs. See if I can catch a glimpse of what's going on, what they got coming up. But you know, we always wonder, and I think if believers, if we wonder what's going on at other churches, can you imagine what non-believers might wonder? What goes on at a church? What are they doing there? Why do people go up there? What's that about? God's plan for the church was for the people on the inside to take the message to the outside. Because many times the outside is not just going to wander in on the inside. The inside's got to take the message outside. One writer put it this way, and I thought it was good. I thought it was good. He said, go back to Acts chapter 1. When the disciples are sitting there looking up into heaven, when Jesus ascends into the clouds, and they're like, man, we see him anymore? No, he's gone. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I guess they're just going to stay there. I'd have stayed there, too. I wouldn't have said, all right, boys, that's it. Let's go to the house. You know, I don't know. They were just kept, I guess they just stood there. I mean, that's not something you see every day, the ascension of Jesus into heaven. So they just stand there looking at And then finally they see two angels, and the angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into this heaven? Basically saying, fellas, you got work to do. Why are you sitting here doing nothing? You can't sit here and looking into the sky, waiting. You've got work to do. You see, this is what can happen to us. We can be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. We can just say, well, I'm just going to sit sulk and sour until Jesus comes. But I'm not going to serve in the kingdom. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to find my place. I'm not going to share my faith. I'm not going to live in the message. And so we've got to get out and tell it. We've got to proclaim. Look at what verse 8 said. Eight, verse 8 tells us that they were proclaiming, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. It has sounded forth. There was a call going out. They were contagious by sharing the message, by proclaiming Jesus, by getting the message out. People weren't having to wonder if they had a building, and we know they didn't in Thessalonica. The church met in houses in the first century. They didn't have a building like we have a building here in Baymanet. But if they did, they wouldn't ride by First Baptist Thessalonica and say, I wonder what's going on in there. The people were already in the streets letting them know, hey, this is what goes on. This is what we're about. This is the message. This is what's happening in the lives of Jesus and in the followers of Christ. Their hearts were ablaze. We can't be irrelevant. Amen. We've got to be relevant to our community. We've got to let them know that Jesus is alive and Jesus is well and ring out this message. One of the saddest things you'll ever see to me, just to me, is a church that's just there. Amen. Have you seen it before? Yeah. When it's got a for sale sign in the, on the yard. It happened right here in this town, didn't it? Yeah. Green Acres Baptist Church. Up out on the highway. When the church ceased to be a church, by the way, it's a daycare center now. 
when the church ceased to be a church and they put a for sale sign up in the front yard. That's hard. Can I tell you something that's even worse? A conservative statistic in this nation, this is a conservative statistic, says between four and 5,000 churches a year today, this year. That's over 70 churches per week will close its doors. Another conservative statistic. Between 4,000 and 4,500 pastors a year will get out of the ministry. It's not going well. It's not going well. And if you look at, and I'm not saying one has to go to seminary to be a pastor. That's not what I'm espousing, but I'm just saying let's just take that as a, as a baseline. If you look at just to say the six Southern Baptist seminaries and you look at their enrollment and you start running a numbers game on four to five thousand people leaving and how many are enrolling, it's not going to keep up. It's not. It's not. So What's happening? The church is losing its ground. The church is not being the church. And that's why I wanted to come back and I want to look at churches in the New Testament. I wanted to come back and see, okay, how are you doing? What were you doing? And what are you doing right so that we in the 21st century can see how do we do this? How do we do this right? And I look and I see the church of Thessalonica was grounded in its relationship with Jesus. That was first and foremost. They lived, they loved, and they preached him. There was no other gospel. The gospel has been and always will be the only way to salvation. And the gospel cannot be modified at all. It cannot be. It can't be a new gospel, a new way. Because when churches try that, the church dies. Because God will not bless that church. The gospel has got to be supreme. This church was passionate about their calling. We found that in these 10 verses. The presence of the gospel was in the person's heart, and it was demonstrated by the power of the gospel in their lives. It did more than reform our behavior. It transforms our being. It's who we are to be a true follower of Jesus. And then in the 10th verse, they had a reason to hope. They were hopeful about their future. So we see that when we're looking and we're seeing where we're to be about serving and waiting. John Stott wrote this about serving and waiting because this is what the 10th verse says. It says, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead so that Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. I was joking about it, but it's, it's true. Sometimes we do. I've been guilty. We've all been guilty if we're honest. Saying, all right, you know, I've been saved. I've been baptized. My family's saved and baptized, which is fortunate to be in that category. We're just going to sit back and wait till Jesus comes. But we serve while we wait. We've got a, we've got a message People got to hear and they've got to know. They've got to belong and they've got to be in. They've got to be a part of. And so Stott wrote this. In Christian terms, serving is getting busy for Christ on earth while waiting is looking for Christ to come from heaven. 
On one hand, however hard we work and serve, there are limits to what we can accomplish. We can only improve our society. We cannot perfect it. We will never build a utopia on earth. For that, we have to wait for Christ to come. So, But we're still serving. We're still waiting for Jesus to come and set it all right. So thus working and, and, and serving and working and waiting go together. We have to work while we wait. And we have to wait while we work. And so that's where that hope is, that holding on to the promises of God for eternity. We just keep hanging on. We just keep holding on because we know God is coming back. God is going to do it in his time, his way, his pleasure, and to his effect. But until then, we serve and we wait. So here's a question for us to think through. Here's a question for us to answer, actually, if any of you want to answer it. There's a myriad of reasons why churches close. There's a lot of reasons. But we also find more and more churches, rather than close, are combining. Y'all have y'all seen that yeah. lately? I've seen that. Maybe some churches that are struggling um, numerically, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the church we were with in, in Montana, that was a combination. We didn't know that until we got there. I didn't, I, nobody had ever mentioned that. But it was two churches in Dillon, Montana that had come together. One was meeting in a not very <laughs> good place, was it, Robert? When we rode past there, we saw where they were meeting, and they were like, you ought to see, if you think the bad, outside's bad, you ought to see the inside. And I'm like, no, I'm good. And the other had a nice building, or a workable building, but it wasn't, didn't have enough people. So God blended these two congregations together. It's a great idea, great plan. It's working. Sometimes, though, churches close because they lost their identity. They lost their focus. They forgot why And when they forgot why they exist and for whom they exist, they became ineffective and irrelevant and dead. I don't know how old I'll get to be before I leave this life. But I do pray for this generation. And I pray this for all of us. We'll never be ineffective. Amen. Yes. Amen. For as long as we get to live, may we have some sort of effect. Yes. Amen. And may we not become ineffective. May we do something in the kingdom. May we make a contribution somehow, some way, and to some specific place. And so when we think about these churches that close and all the things we we, we Sometimes people just lose sight of their reason for existence. Why am I even here? We get caught up in so many things. So here's the question. I still was going to ask a question. Let me ask the question. Why is it that you think, do you think, just this is for the moment. Okay, this is off the cuff. This isn't thought through, prayed through. I understand that. But why are so many churches, can, can we become ineffective or irrelevant when it comes to impacting our world? What can happen in a church that can lead us to ineffectiveness or irrelevance? This is totally off the cuff, I know. I didn't send a text, hey, we're gonna ask a question now. <laughs> what do you think happens in a church that makes us ineffective or irrelevant? Where do you think we start losing our focus? I think I do. Well, you know, people start looking at other people and say, well, this is the way they believe, so let's make our church look like that so they'll come and they'll have a crowd. 
In an attempt to be relevant, we've lost our biblical relevance. We sold out. I was talking to a pastor today, a guy I hadn't heard from in a long time, called me today. I couldn't take the call right away, heard the message, called him back. Hey, brother, I just wanted you to know I had to step down. Wow. Church was torn up. Infighting in the church. Wasn't going anywhere, but nowhere. I had to step down. I just wanted to call you to ask you to pray for me. I said, I will. I will. Because I have no idea what I'm about to do in this moment. But I do know, this is words of hope. God has called me to this ministry. And I'm not stepping away from ministry. But I don't know what I'm going to do in this moment. That's what I said. I said, with that attitude, with that heart, with that commitment, it's not over. It's over there, but it's not over. Yeah, it happened. When I did the play this clip, I don't want to say too much. The Lord's laid a message on my heart. I've been preparing. I don't know where I'm going to preach. Uh, I think it might be right now. Let's go with it. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm messing with you. <laughs> this is the teaser, okay? Now, the, I believe that the problem, the, the greatest problem that we face in our day and church is the, Satan's attack to break the unity of the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the church, the genius of the church is that God has created from every tribe and tongue and nation and God. And I'm God so sorry. <laughs> That's me. I, I get up. <laughs> I'm hung up. Hang on. And, and Go ahead. brought us together in one. And the, and the unity of the church is the genius of it. And, and the, the diversity is there, but we're all one in Christ. Mm -hmm. So he attacks us at that point. But the mission of every member of the church is to help other members. And the stronger should be helping the weaker. Paul's all about this in all of his letters, so what so is James, John, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, this was the great problem in that early church. The more mature members just ran off and left the, the weaker. And not too much has changed since first century because we have our mature group and we're all in. I mean, we're all in. The core group, we're all in. But we've got brothers and sisters that are struggling. Some of them want to give up on church altogether. Some of them have given up on church mm -hmm. altogether. And uh, that's how Satan breaks our unity. And I really think it's all because we forget, we, we maybe forget that a part of the Great Commission, after they went them, they put them baptized, they said, now teach them. Disciple. And when they saw and they struggled, Paul says, we need to bury their dead. We need to come along and help them first. That's all the sermon I'm going to preach now. But <laughs> that, that's an answer to your question. Though. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and, you know, and we were, um, earlier in the month, there was a deacon night, uh, uh, invited all the deacons to go to the, this meal, and, and so we had a share time, and um, some of them are in this room now, but um, others are elsewhere serving tonight. But, uh, you know, we talked about similarly to this, and I was sharing with, with those men, sometimes the temptation is real to get on somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can get on them. I'm going to get on them. Where you been? I'm getting on you. And I was telling them, Guys, we've got to be sure we're not on them. Don't get on them. Don't stay on them. Stay with them. Amen. 
the word with and own are two very drastically yeah. different words. Yeah. You get on me, I'm probably going to reject you. If you stay with me, I've got a lot better chance of winning me back. So stay with me, not on me. You know what I'm saying? You know, believe in me. Bring me, bring me along with you. Still keep me in your family. Keep me in your love. Keep me in your, stay with me, not on me. And so, you know, and so, you know, a lot of times our churches can become ineffective. We do have infighting. We do have uh, a lot of these different things. I, I think we, you know, I, I jotted down, of course, it's, my, it's a question I'm asking, so I jotted down some stuff. Um, I just think inward focus. Our churches get inwardly focused. We, we think about us. We think about what I like, what I want, what I need, what I, what, what, what do we, what do we, what do we, and so when we, get, when we can look at ministries of a church and we can see that this church's ministries are more focused on us yeah. than focused out there, and there's got to be a balance. I'm not saying we can't focus inward. We, we need to focus inward, but we also got to, got to balance that and, and focus that out too. We got to figure out, you know, okay, what are we doing? in this community? How are we impacting this community? What are we doing for this community? What are we doing to draw people here? We, we know all we're doing is drawing people to the place and the message the Lord draws them to salvation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we got to find the way to draw them to the place and to the message. And then the, the Lord's business is drawing them to salvation. And once they're drawn to salvation, drawing them to that full surrender of our lives to the Lord, but it's a, it's a pro, it literally is a process. It is a discipleship process, as Dr. Cox was saying. You know, baptize, we've got to go and teach them and baptize them in my name, and teaching them all that I've commanded you. That comes next. Yeah. It's the discipleship. It's staying with them and, and pulling them in. So, you know, I just uh, I never. I never want this personally. I never want this for a church, any church, this church. I never want to be somewhere where I look back in the mirror one day and go, ineffective. 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 Yeah. Made little to no difference. Somewhere we've got to do something. Complacency, yeah. Oh, this is this is you know. I guess I guess you could tell maybe in January. It's just Wednesday nights just sort of taking a new vein for me. I just figured if I could get this group of people to start praying about the ministry of First Baptist Church, however many people are in here on Wednesday thinking through and recapturing what our vision is. And we've got people serving and doing with choir and students and youth and all the other things. And that's all great. But if we can start, God, what are you wanting to do? What is it you're doing? And we can start capturing that and praying toward that and seeing what God will do. Thank you for your input. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you for the model that we have. Lord, not that they were model people or a model church necessarily, but certainly they were indeed on to something in Thessalonica a long time ago. And what the message is for us are the principles that are applied. Lord, the Antioch effect that we find in in the church of Antioch that was ministering, mission-minded, and all of it together, the model of that church was just phenomenal. And without question, there were problems in the churches, Lord, and things that people had to address and work in and work through. And so, Lord, again, while we're serving while we're waiting, and we're, we're, we're working while we're waiting, and Lord, that we've got a mission, and I pray that we will for your kingdom's sake and for your glory and your glory alone, Father, be found effective and neither ineffective. 
and I pray this in Christ's name.